Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Alexander Rufus Isaacs. I'm Vice President of the Beverly Hills Bar, and I am the chair for today's program, which is the latest in the War Stories series. We're very proud to be featuring today one of our finest trial lawyers, Yacoub Hazard, talking about a fascinated and protracted piece of litigation between Motown's Barry Gordy and the legendary Holland Dozier Holland songwriting team, which wrote many of Motown's greatest hits, including 10 of the Supreme's 12 US singles, such as Baby Love, Stop in the Name of Love, and You Keep Me Hanging On. Jakub is a partner at Michel Silverberg and Mupp, who specializes in litigating high profile matters involving IP, rights of publicity, privacy, breach of contract, profit participation, and other media and entertainment related conflicts over a wide range of industries. He began his career at MSK in the 1990s developed his entertainment practice at the firm as representing the Recording Industry Association of America and the Napster dispute. And over his career, he's represented an array of entertainment industry clients from the Ray Charles Foundation to Incubus and Weezer, many foreign distributors and leading video games companies. Uh, most recently at NBC Universal, uh, Yacoub handled all profit participation audits and litigation for the company's television, film and consumer products business. In addition, he oversaw copyright, trademark, and general litigation matters brought by or against NBC Universal. Yacoub will be interviewed today by my dear friend and partner, Holly T. Browdy, who specializes in all facets of the music industry. Holly was VP, Music, Business, and Legal Affairs at the Walt Disney Company, and has a broad and varied experience in the industry, having worked at Polygram Records, Left Bank Organization, Polygram Music Publishing, Tonos Entertainment, and now in private practice. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, questions, if you have any, please put them in the Q&A function, and they will be answered at the end if we have time. And the housekeeping information with your MCLE certificates and a link to the exhibit for this program will be placed in the chat function very shortly. With that, thank you very much for attending today. I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful program, and I'm going to hand over now to Holly. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased to have Yacoub explaining to us something that I don't know whether to describe it as a lawsuit. It's, it's pretty much an entire generational history of lawsuits and countersuits, and, and uh, it's absolutely fascinating. It involves Motown, Motown's founder, Barry Gordy, uh, Eddie Holland of the legendary Holland Dozier Holland songwriting team. And I think one of the most fascinating things about it is that it is very complex, not only on the interpersonal side, but it is also very complex on the procedural side. So it juggles a, a number of, of different things from motion practice to managing client expectations and egos. So, uh, Yacoub. Thank you, Holly, I appreciate it. Thank you for the introduction and thank you, Alexander. It's a pleasure to be here and being able to share uh, the story about one of the more fascinating cases that I've ever been involved in throughout my career. Um, Alexander and Holly have kind of set the stage a little bit about who the players are, but let me just go through them again one more time and kind of give you like the background story leading up to my personal involvement in this series of lawsuits. Uh, as uh, Holly and Alexander mentioned, our clients were Barry Gordy, founder of Motown Records, um, Motown Records and Motown Records uh, music publishing entity called Jobet Music Publishing. Um, for those of you who don't know, and I was surprised to learn that there are, are some people who don't know because of how uh, um, old I've gotten, you know, Barry Gordy uh, really revolutionized music in the early 1960s through the Motown sound, um, presenting to the world such artists as Diana Ross and the Supreme, Stevie Wonder, Marvin Gaye, Jackson 5, and the list goes on and on. I say this because uh, a few days ago I was speaking with one of my younger colleagues at the firm and I was telling her about the presentation. I said, yeah, I represented Barry Gordy. She had this blank stare on her uh, on her face. And so I wanted to, for the younger members of the audience, just kind of give you that little historical background information. On the other side of this series of uh, lawsuits were 
the songwriting trio, Holland Dozier Holland, uh, that's comprised of Eddie Holland, who was kind of the leader of the, the, of the trio. He was the architect uh, and the uh, writer of all the lyrics of the songs that became these great Motown hits. Uh, a gentleman named Lamont Dozier, who was a neighbor of his, uh, uh, who grew up next door to Eddie Holland, and Eddie Holland's youngest brother named Brian Holland. Uh, Lamont Dozier and Brian Holland, they wrote the musical parts of the songs. Again, Eddie Holland wrote the lyrics and was considered to be uh, the leader of that group. And um, uh, Alexander gave a list of some of the famous songs that they uh, they wrote over the years, so I won't bother uh, repeating those uh, right now. So let me give you a little bit of uh, of the background of what what transpired before uh, I got involved in this series of lawsuits. In 1968, after about um, five years of generating all the early hits in Motown, and after serving as the head of the artist and repertoire department at Motown Records, Eddie Holland decided that he, Lamont Dozier, and his brother Brian Holland were going to leave Motown and set up their own competing record label that they called Invictus Records. And that they were going to basically take their sound to Invictus and recreate it and continue to generate hits under that new label. Well, Mr. Gordy was not pleased with that development and filed a lawsuit against the three of them to try to prevent them from opening and starting this competing record company. In response to that, um, HDH, as we'll call them throughout uh, this uh, uh, discussion today, filed a counterclaim against Mr. Gorey and Motown Records and Joe Bett, alleging a series of horribles regarding the accountings that um, they had been, uh, that Joe Bett had been providing to them for those these hit songs that they had written. After a few years of, of struggling and, and battling back and forth, they finally settled that lawsuit and everyone kind of went their own ways. And there was about 15 or so years of peace. Then in 1987, um, I, uh, uh, Joe Bett Music Company received a levy from the IRS levying on Eddie Holland's royalty account with Joe Bett. And again, the songs that HDH wrote during their time with Motown and Joe Bett were are what we would call evergreen songs, right? And they're still played, uh, get tremendous airplay today and generate tremendous amounts of uh, publishing royalties um, uh, for all the times that it gets played and all the sales of, of remakes, et cetera, of the records. And so there was a lot of money that was sitting in uh, Eddie Holland's royalty account at the time the IRS served Joe Bett with the levy. And once Eddie Holland found out about the IRS levy, he immediately contacted Joe Bett uh, and Barry Gordy and Motown, both uh, in writing and uh, you know, over the phone, and told them in no uncertain terms that if they pay the I his royalties to the IRS instead of paying the royalties to him, Eddie Holland, that he was going to sue Gordy, Motown, and Joe Bett, and they would rue the day that they sent his money to someone else. At the time, uh, uh, Mr. Gorey and Eddie Holland had, you know, really no bad blood between them because they had kind of been away from each other for a number of years. And so in an effort to try to accommodate Eddie Holland, um, Mr. Gordy had Joe Bett attempt to file a federal interpleader action where they filed a lawsuit in the district court, federal district court in Michigan, and attempted to interplead the funds that were the subject of the IRS levy that were contained in Eddie Holland's royalty account. That didn't last very long or go very well because the federal judge uh, that the case was assigned to immediately granted a motion by the IRS to dismiss Joe Bett's lawsuit and ordered Joe Bett to pay <clears throat> the, um, the money to the IRS instead of Eddie Holland and essentially told Joe Bett and every other uh, person who gets serve with an IRS tax levy, that when you get served with an IRS tax levy, you honor it. You don't try to file an interpleader action in federal court or do anything other than simply pay that money over to the IRS. So following the dismissal and admonishment um, by the judge, Joe Bett proceeded to pay the money to the IRS as it was ordered to do by the federal court judge. Well, less than a year later in 1988, as he had threatened, Eddie Holland filed a lawsuit against Joe Bett, basically saying that Joe Bett had committed fraud and breached its 
um, uh, accounting obligations in contract with Eddie Holland by, by paying that money over to the IRS instead of to Eddie himself. The, uh, and that case was filed in Wayne County Circuit Court, which is basically state court in downtown Detroit, Michigan. Well, that case didn't last very long either as the state court judge that was assigned to the case looked at the previous ruling that had been issued by the federal court in the interpleader action and, and quickly uh, dismissed Eddie Holland's case saying this has already been adjudicated and, and litigated in the interpleader action and the federal court had made clear and directed and ordered Joe Bett to pay the money to the IRS and Joe Bett could not be sued for honoring the IRS levy and following the order from the federal district court to pay the money to the IRS. And so that case gets dismissed. Eddie Holland then files an appeal of that case, which ends up going all the way up to the Supreme Court and becomes an important uh, thing to remember as I continue to tell this story going forward. Apparently not satisfied with having filed and lost the 1988 case, a few years later in 1992, um, Eddie Holland files a new lawsuit against Gordy, Motown, and Joe Bed. And this time he tries to raise the stakes by naming a bunch of individual officers and employees at uh, those companies as individual defendants, including the in-house counsel at the time, the head of the accounting department at the companies at the time, and the head of the IT department for the companies at the time. Really just trying to be as aggressive and um, difficult as possible in following the lawsuit. He then coerces his songwriting partners, Lamont Dozier and Brian Holland to file copycat, copycat lawsuits of their own against the same defendants alleging the same claims. And those claims were for fraud, breach of contract, accounting, and alter ego finding against Barry Gordy personally, arguing that Motown and Joe Bett weren't real companies, that those were just alter egos set up by Mr. Gordy to uh, run his personal business through. And the lawsuit contained very, very colorful allegations that garnered a lot of media attention at the time, including an allegation that Motown and Joe Bett executives were engaged in payola with various record companies, and that were, they were flying around the country, literally carrying bags of cash in the carry-on um, uh, items for, for this all of this payola and as the lawyer for the uh, HDH would like to say from time to time to the judge, you know, remember cash judge, trying to remind the judge of these outlandish uh, uh, allegations that were contained in these complaints. Well, that lawsuit kind of, you know, uh, went along at a really slow pace and not a lot of things happened in the case for a number of years, in large part because uh, Eddie Holland's lawyer, got disbarred about two years into the case. And the case got put basically on pause while uh, Holland, Dozier and Holland tried to find new counsel to replace this disbarred lawyer. He would be, he, he would come to be the first of two of Eddie Holland's lawyers that got disbarred during the course of this series of lawsuits. We'll get to the, the second disbarred lawyer in a little while. So the case had been on hold, but then they had gotten some new counsel, very aggressive lawyers, there was a lawyer who had represented DeLorean in one of his uh, cases back in the day, and they really got the case moving and um, kind of had the, the uh, Mr. Gordy and Motown and Joe Betts lawyers, who was a sole practitioner at the time, who had had great success up to that point in all these cases, including in the 1988 case, but kind of had him on his heels a little bit because they were starting to outgun him. And so at that point in the late 90s, I get brought into the case along with uh, Daniel Petrocelli and a gentleman named Duke Drew Bruder. We were all at MSK at the time. And one of our partners who had a relationship with Barry Gordy found out about the case and they asked us to take it over. Um, you know, Dan obviously was the, the top trial lawyer, our associate at the time. Uh, Drew Bruder was a, a up and coming uh, lawyer. And I was kind of the music litigation specialist because I had done a lot of music related litigation at the firm representing record companies and, and music publishers and kind of really understood the industry and so that's why i was brought in as a member of the team and um the first thing that happened was that we got brought in literally on 
about two weeks before a hearing on an order to show cause why our clients, the defendants in that case, should not be defaulted for spoliation of evidence. So this is right a great first uh, a matter to have to deal with in a case that you've just joined. And the issue involved the fact that earlier in the litigation, uh, a document production was staged by the defendants containing it's comprised of 128 boxes of various accounting documents that they had made available to uh, uh, HDH's counsel for review and copy that related to, you know, the accounting uh, statements and uh, issues that were in dispute. And for whatever reason, I guess the uh, HDH's lawyers didn't copy everything that they wanted at that time. And so they later in the case asked that the defendants make those same 128 boxes of documents available again for them to review, inspect, and, and copy. And no one could find the 128 boxes at this point in time. It had been a couple of years before they had been first made available and no one knew what had happened to those boxes. And the court was very upset and thought that the defendants maybe had, you know, uh, thrown away critical relevant evidence during the pendency of the lawsuit. So my first task was to try to figure out what the hell happened to these 128 boxes of documents. And so I went and I did an investigation. I began interviewing the accounting people who had put the materials together, Mr. Gorey's primary assistant, um, uh, the lovely lady who has since passed away, who kind of oversaw everything in, in Barry Gorey's world. And I came to the conclusion that there were 128 boxes of documents that consisted of various accounting documents that fortunately someone at the time had prepared contemporaneously an index of what was in each of the 128 boxes of documents, that they were all simply accounting documents that were printed out from the Joe Bet accounting system, and that we should be able to recreate and reprint the exact same materials because we had all the information still stored electronically. I also determined that what physically happened to the 128 boxes of the documents was that in the, in the two year intervening period, Mr. Gordy had sold both Motown Records and Joe Bet Music and had essentially downsized and closed the, Mo, the Motown and Joe Bet offices. And that these 128 boxes were in the lobby of their offices as they were closing and uh, up the the offices and that somehow they must have gotten discarded along with a bunch of other things when they cleaned out the offices uh, when they were being closed. And so I put together a short memo, it was maybe three or four pages, a memo to the file with copies to the members of our litigation team explaining the results of my investigation, what I thought had happened and say, ah, but it doesn't matter, the good news is we have an index of what were in the 128 boxes of documents. They're all still uh, records that reside in the computers at Joe Bet, and we can simply reprint, recreate the whole thing, kind of a no harm, no foul kind of situation. So I do that in the span of about 10 days. We then are on the, you know, two days before the uh, OSC hearing. Um, you know, Mr. Gordy, you know, hires a private plane for us to go out to attend the hearing. My first time on a private plane, I was very excited. Um, we get out there, uh, introduce, you know, we get admitted into the, uh, the the case. We go and introduce ourselves to the judge. He welcomes us, thanks us for for coming. You know, says welcome to the party, and then he looks at us. Right, we're there for an OSC rate default against our clients. Right, very serious hearing. He looks at all the lawyers. He goes, "Okay, why are you here?" Not even re remembering that he had issued this OSC regarding a potential default. So, you know, we quickly remind the judge, well, your honor, we're here to respond to this OSC. We filed some papers in response. Hopefully you've had a chance to read them. The bottom line is we determined where, what the contents of the 128 boxes were. And we are in the process of reprinting everything and recreating it so that it could be made available for the other side. Judge says, okay, fine. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, the OSC is discharged. Let's just proceed with the rest of the regular discovery. Interestingly, this judge, and we're, you know, we happened to be in Detroit because that's where Motown and Joe Bet were in those early days before Mr. Gordy moved about to LA. And unfortunately, you know, they don't see very many music cases in Detroit. And so this particular judge 
did not really understand the business of music publishing and exactly what Joe Bed did. And literally at the beginning of almost every appearance in front of him, he would ask the same question. Now, what business is Joe Bed in again? And we would have to explain to him, it's a music publishing company. It owns the songs, it collects the money, and then it pays the songwriters their share of, of the money that gets, this was like an ongoing, ongoing thing. And the Wayne County Courthouse itself is like something that's out of, um, I don't know, uh, some, some form of a movie. It's a hustle and bustle. There's a statue of the boxer Joe Lewis out in front. It's a lot of uh, uh, homelessness around the, the, the courtroom, you know, really bad part of downtown Detroit. And we actually kind of early on in the process nicknamed it Night Court, right? Based upon the old TV show that was on at the time. And so we would always say, oh, we got to go back to Night Court next week. So let's ever, let's ever you know, get ready for the fun. So in any event, so that OSC gets discharged and the case is uh, you know, proceeding along and now we're into the depositions of various parties. And, and we're sitting in a deposition in our offices. I'm defending one of the main defendant witnesses. It was the head of the IT department at the time. And the examining lawyer for Holland Dozier Holland asks us if he can have his secretary fax a document to our office that he wants to use as an exhibit because he had forgotten to bring it with him. You know, back in the days when you couldn't just send the PDF, you had to do the good old fashioned fax machine. And so we said, fine, no problem. Um, and, and my colleague goes to pick up the, the fax and, and gets it and brings it into the deposition conference room and gives it to opposing counsel. And then he leans over to me and says, he has a copy of your memo about the 128 boxes. And like, really, how could that possibly be? Well, we figured it out later and I'll tell you how it came to be that he got the, the box, the, the, my particular memo. A couple of weeks before that particular deposition, we had to uh, produce some additional documents and we had replaced the lawyer who was the sole practitioner in, in uh, Detroit with a bigger law firm because we just thought we needed more manpower and someone with a little bit more resources to be our local counsel. And we decided that we would just let them handle the document production. We sent them a detailed memo saying, here are the 12 boxes of documents that you should put into the conference room for review by HDH's lawyers. And unbeknownst to us, apparently an additional box got put into the conference room and it was a box that contained the correspondence files from the previous Detroit lawyer that they had just substituted in place of. And among the correspondence files, within the correspondence files in this box, which became known as the infamous box 13, um, was a copy of my memo with the attachment explaining about the whereabouts of the 128 uh, boxes of documents. The ironic part about that part of the story was we, we joked um, among ourselves that we didn't think we needed to fly someone out from our office, right, to, to stage a document production involving 12 boxes of documents. We figured they could handle that without our involvement. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> In any event, so that's how we learned that he obtained this document, my uh, memo. And so we ultimately, when we demanded that they return the memo and agree not to use it, they refused repeatedly completely refused and stole, stole all of their ethical obligations. And so what we ended up doing, and this was a really critical turning point, in my opinion, in the Detroit case, was we filed a motion to have the opposing counsel disqualified for, right, for violating their ethical obligations with respect to the inadvertent production of, a privileged, of privileged documents, including my uh, privilege and work product memo. Uh, not to be outdone, of course, they filed a, a, their own motion against our clients, again, seeking a default, claiming that my privileged work product memo conclusively established that the defendants had in fact spoliated and destroyed relevant evidence during the pendency of the case and that they wanted that, uh, that remedy imposed because they had this smoking gun, which they thought was my, uh, my memo. Well, the judge who we learned was kind of an ethicist uh, a self-acclaimed ethicist decided that he would have an evidentiary hearing on both motions. And, uh, and once he did that, the kangaroo court commenced because what you had was a situation where 
the lawyers would go from being examining attorneys to being witnesses themselves and vice versa. In fact, I testified during this hearing since my memo was so critical to this whole thing. I testified for over three days being subject to direct examination by Dan Petrocelli and then you know, lengthy cross-examination by the other side. Um, there were moments where uh, one of the lawyers from the other side was sitting in the witness box being examined by one of my colleagues and the judge asked my colleague a question about a document that he was seeking to have introduced into evidence. And my colleague answered the question. And then the lawyer sitting in the witness box turns to the judge and says, can I ask a couple of follow-up questions? And the judge says, sure. And so the guy proceeds to ask like 10 minutes worth of questions of my colleague who's standing at counsel table while the lawyer is supposed to be the witness in the witness box. It was like complete role reversal. It got to the point where, you know, we just couldn't believe how crazy the proceedings were going. And at one point, I think we even quipped to the judge that we were going to call him as our next witness in this evidentiary hearing since there were no, no apparent rules that were, were taking place. So the, the judge quickly, not quickly, but the judge ultimately, and, and this lasted for four weeks, by the way, over the course of about six months, it was a four week trial. And the judge ultimately found that, um, the production of the memo and the other documents was completely inadvertent that the uh, HDHS council had violated their ethical obligations by not notifying us immediately that there were privileged materials and confirming that whether or not we intended to, to uh, produce those and further compounded this ethical uh, uh, violations by refusing to, re to return that memo and the other documents. Um, uh, at, you know, upon our demand. And while the judge went short of ordering disqualification, he did issue, uh, he did award issue preclusion sanctions uh, in order that they had to return the, the memo and all other privileged documents and could not use any of them for any purpose uh, going forward during the lawsuit and ordered that we were entitled to an award of our attorney's fees. Of course, HDH appealed that ruling in an interesting, um, scenario that appeal ended up being heard. We were told it was going to be heard by the, the, the appellate court at a college in Ann Arbor, a law school in Ann Arbor. So we thought we were going to Michigan University Law School, right, to have this oral argument because the court would do this from time to time where they would go and conduct the arguments at law school so that law students can observe. Instead, we were at some really small random law school in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but the auditorium was full of a bunch of law students. And when our case got called, and this was a good sign for us, the appellate court, before uh, beginning the argument, turns, the chief judge turns to the audience of law students and said, this is a real interesting case about what happens when you don't follow your ethical obligations with respect to the production of privileged documents. And this should be a good lesson for you guys uh, uh, once you hear the arguments in this case. So we knew we were in pretty good shape in front of that court of appeal panel based upon that kind of introductory comment. Long story short, court of appeal affirms the uh, decision and we get back to the state court. We now file our motion for attorney's fees seeking, you know, close to a million dollars because we had been in basically in trial for four weeks throughout a protracted uh, period of time. And believe it or not, under Michigan procedure, a party is entitled to an evidentiary hearing on a motion for attorney's fees. So HDH requ requested an evidentiary hearing, and here we go, starting all over again with a new evidentiary hearing in front of the same judge where the lawyers, mainly me, uh, end up being uh, witnesses in, in the evidentiary hearing. And so Mr. Petrocelli, God bless him, did they decided I had done such a good job of testifying in the first uh, uh, evidentiary hearing on the disqualification that they were going to use me as the witness to go through and justify the uh, the uh, fees that we were seeking in, as part of the motion for attorney's fees. And so I was on the stand this time, not three and a half days, but six days going painfully through each time entry that we were seeking to recover and explaining to the court in response to cross-examination by the other side, why those particular fees and items were related to the motion uh, to disqualify that we had previously filed in one. And there were a couple of real uh, uh, memorable moments during that cross-examination. I, re I remember one was 
there was a particular day where I had two entries that was of my time. And the first entry was meeting with XYZ, one of the other lawyers in the firm about the disqualification or about a discovery issue, which was related to this disqualification motion. And then my next entry just said meeting with Dan Petricelli. And we were not seeking the money for my meeting with Dan Petricelli, but we were seeking my the, the uh, recovery of the entry relating to the discovery of the disqualification. And so the lawyer says, well, how do you know your, your first entry that on that same day was of a meeting about discovery? How do you know your meeting with Mr. Petricelli wasn't also about discovery? And I looked at him and I said, Mr. Petricelli doesn't do discovery. That's all I know. <laughs> so that was the answer to that one. And so we went on and uh, ultimately finished that. And while that uh, motion was under submission with the judge as he was considering how much to award an attorney's fee, the appeal of Eddie Holland's dismissed 1988 case became final. All appeals had been exhausted, it had been affirmed by the Court of Appeal uh, uh, and affirmed by the Michigan Supreme Court. And that case was now fully and finally over. And that gave us the chance to go on the offensive. So what did we do? We took that 1988 case that Eddie Holland had lost that had no basis to be filed in the first place and used it as the basis to file a malicious prosecution case against Eddie Holland out here in Los Angeles Superior Court. We were assigned, uh, we actually filed in Santa Monica since Mr. Gorey lived on the West Side. Meanwhile, the uh, Michigan case, right, is still on ice because the judge had still kept everything on stay. He had stayed the entire case while he was still considering how much to award to us in attorney's fees. And the ironic part about all of this is that we ended up getting a trial date in our malicious prosecution case that we filed in uh, 2002 before the judge had ever finished ruling on and lifting the stay in the Detroit case. So now we're totally on the offensive and they have no case that's, that's proceeding forward. So we end up working up that malicious prosecution case and now it's time for the actual trial. And the trial was act was bifurcated because in a malicious prosecution case, there are certain issues, probable cause, the being the and favorable termination being the main two, that are issues that are to be decided by the court, right? That are issues for the judge. And then the, the other issues, uh, whether the person acted with malice in commencing and prosecuting the lawsuit and damages, those were legal issues for the jury. And so what we did was we bifurcated the case and said, let's try the legal matters first to the judge to get those things established and then we'll take a, a, a pause and then we'll have the second phase where we'll impanel a jury and, and litigate the malice and damages issues assuming that we prevailed in the first uh, uh, court trial phase and so the, the judge agreed and we were ready for trial so we show up the morning of the first day of trial and we we call ready and there's no eddie holland his lawyer's there, but there's no Eddie Holland. Oh, I forgot the part about Eddie Holland's disbarred lawyer in a malicious prosecution case. The first lawyer that represented him in that case got disbarred about three weeks into the case. It turned out that he had been a uh, sitting judge in Michigan who got kicked off of the bench for accepting bribes to fix traffic tickets. Got disbarred in Michigan, moved to California, purported to wave in to California, and never disclosed the fact that he had this little disciplinary problem from his days as being a judge in Michigan. And somehow that, that came out about a month into the, uh, the malicious prosecution case. And so he was the second of Eddie Holland's lawyers to be disbarred. So anyway, back to the first day of trial. So we get there and there's no Eddie Holland. And the judge is not very happy and is asking Eddie's lawyers, where is he? And this is what the lawyer proceeds to tell him. Eddie Holland had left town the weekend before the first day of trial because he was not feeling well uh, as a result of hypertension that he suffered from. And he wanted to go seek out the expertise of one of the top uh, doctors in the country who treats hypertension in African-American men. And that guy just happened to be in, in Nevada, in Las Vegas, Nevada. And so he went to Las Vegas, Nevada to seek this emergency medical treatment on the eve of trial. Well, we were obviously were not very pleased and did some of our own homework about this particular doctor and um, hired actually our own uh, medical expert doctor to say, hey, there's no such thing as a specialist for 
hypertension in African American men that he could have sought that treatment anywhere. That be that this doctor who looked him up and knows him from other from various professional organizations was not even a specialist in what they were claiming um, he was a specialist in, and that. And we concluded in our the court that this was all a ruse by Eddie Holland simply to avoid having to face the trial in, in, a, in a last ditch effort to derail our ability to proceed and get this case once and uh, you know uh, put the bed and tried. So the judge was not very pleased and ended up um, uh, uh, issued a pretty strict order saying that if Eddie Holland doesn't show up by, I think it was two days later, and appear in court that she was going to enter his default and allow us to go ahead and proceed with proving up our damages as part of a default uh, judgment prove up. Well, Eddie ended up showing up um, at the last second, not very happy, trying to look as though he were sick, you know, even though we know he really wasn't. And we proceeded with the first phase of uh, the bifurcated trial, um, which we won on all fronts. The court found that uh, Eddie Holland had no probable cause to have brought that 1988 case in the first instance, given the fact that in 1987, the federal court had essentially told Joe Beck to do exactly what it did. Uh, and that the, it, that the way that the case was dismissed was a, a favorable uh, ruling on the merits for purposes of our ability to proceed on a malicious prosecution action. Um, and so we went on those two issues and the um, court did adjourned and said, all right, we'll come back and we'll have the jury uh, phase of the trial in about two weeks. And well, I'll see you then. And so we went, we retreated back to our offices. I'll never forget one of the associates that we had brought in on the trial team, <laughs> did not realize that there was a second phase of the trial. And when we told him that there was a second phase, he was like, oh man, I was just waiting for the first phase to end before I gave notice. <laughs> So, so he proceeded to give notice and not participate in the second part of the of the trial. But as it turned out, there would never be a second part of the trial because uh, during the two week intervening period between the end of the first phase and the, uh, the scheduled jury trial, uh, Mr. Gordy and Eddie Holland got together. They kissed and made up, patched everything up, and all and agreed to dismiss all litigation and. Um, as a result, Mr. Gordy dismissed his malicious prosecution case. Eddie Holland, Lamont Dozier, and Brian Holland dismissed each of one of their cases back in Detroit. And Eddie Holland and Barry Gordy went on to become, uh, resumed to be being friends and become chess buddies that I think still get together and play chess on a weekly basis uh, today. Unfortunately for Eddie Holland, he still has the bad habit of, of not paying his taxes. And so if you were to Google him, you will see that he continued to have major tax problems with the IRS, including as recently as 2017. And he still remains litigious to this point because every time the IRS tries to uh, collect its money from him, he files a lawsuit against the IRS or someone to try to deflect. Um, but that's that's how the case uh, or cases finally came to a merciful end. I mean, to this day, uh, the, the, the team, Dan and uh, Drew Bruder get together on a regular basis just to kind of reminisce about these good old times and the, the crazy days in Detroit um, and the, the various characters that were involved in the lawsuit, including the fact that one of Lamont Dozier's lawyers most recently just refereed the uh, Super Bowl uh, a couple of months ago. I guess he quit the law and became an NFL referee after, after his experience in the Holland Dozier Holland litigation, which is kind of a funny thing. But the case taught me a couple of uh, interesting and important things that I still believe in to this day. Uh, the first is that, you know, when you're a defendant, anytime you can do something to deflect and derail the case that you're discussing something other than the merits of plaintiff's claims, you're winning as the defendant, which is exactly what we did in the Detroit case by making the whole lawsuit of eventually about the lawyer's conduct rather than these crazy uh, allegations about you know people were flying around with bags of cash as alleged to buy HDH in their complaints, uh, but you know anytime you can make the the dispute about something other than the merits of the plaintiff's case, you, you're making great progress as a defendant uh, because they never got back to getting to argue about the merits of their case once we raised this disqualification issue that consumed the case completely, that consumed what the court cared about, that consumed what the judge was focused on and uh, was, a, was a great 
uh, kind of a great lesson that I learned uh, through that process. The other thing is if you can ever have the opportunity to be on the offensive, that's the best thing to do. The best defense is an aggressive offense and that malicious prosecution case, right? Which was really filed in an effort, not so much to win it, even though we'd love to, but it was really to force Eddie Holland and his brother and Lamont Dozier to revisit and rethink about whether they really wanted to continue to pursue their cases in, in Detroit. And it actually ended up working when they saw that while their Detroit case was on hold because of the conduct of their lawyers, Eddie was about to get hit with a couple million dollar judgment based upon the malicious prosecution case that we had filed in the, in uh, Los Angeles Superior Court. Uh, and, uh, you know, those were, in addition to kind of the crazy stories that this case uh, 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 reminds me of or brings to, to, to mind are those two particular important lessons about kind of litigation strategy and ways to, to, um, to handle cases and do things that are a little bit out of the box uh, to turn the tide in a case where, frankly, before that disqualification motion motion uh, issue arose, you know, we had some concerns about the, the the case in Detroit, mainly because we didn't know if the judge was going to be sophisticated enough to understand to grant a summary judgment motion. We would be stuck with a trial probably in front of the in, in a before a Detroit jury, and people in Detroit were still at that time, a little upset that Barry Gordy had moved the companies from Detroit to Los Angeles. So it was not necessarily a great venue for, for us, even though he was from Detroit himself. So with that, uh, Holly, I think we can uh, open up to some questions or comments or anything you've got to ask of me about this crazy case that was HDH versus Barry Gordy. I think you're muted. Okay, there, you go. there we go. Um, I have the question or two, but I think probably our viewers have more questions. Um, okay. So why don't we give them a shot? All right, let me take a look. I don't see any, any in the Q&A right now. Is that where they're going to be? think that's where they were going to be. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, Yakub, what, to what extent do you think that Barry's personality and Eddie's personality affected the way this all went? It sounds like there were a lot of motions brought and a lot of lawsuits brought that were more for harassment or for personal ego reasons than for actual legal reasons. I think that the egos of both, both of those gentlemen played a large part in why this lawsuit was so expensive and hard fought. Um, you know, Eddie Holland always thought he should have been Barry Gordy. He came to learn during the course of the lawsuit it kind of resented the fact that Gordy was Gordy and he was not. And Barry Gordy is Barry Gordy. I mean, he had built a musical empire literally from scratch you know, based upon borrowing a few bucks from his older sister to found the company to begin with. And, you know, there was no way that he was going to be pushed around or intimidated um, by Eddie Holland or anybody else. And so you had two very strong personalities. You also had uh, a crazy lawyer for Eddie Holland at the beginning, the one who was disbarred during the Michigan proceeding. He was a wild man. And, you know, he would get these guys riled up um, and get them to do things and file stuff that really had no basis in fact. I mean, like th this whole thing about people flying around with bags of cash was like one of the more ridiculous allegations I've ever seen in a lawsuit of this type, yet they kept ha trying to hammer that point home. They kept trying to remind the judge, yeah, this is about, you know, them moving cash off the books and we need to, to get all this discovery in order to establish that that's exactly what was going on. But more to your, you know, back to your question, yeah, it was, I think the, a lot of the decisions, um, particularly on the Eddie Holland side, were really ego-driven. I mean, for him to file that 1992 lawsuit and then talk his brother and Lamont Dozier into filing copycat lawsuits of their own, I think was, um, was his effort to try to really pile on and kind of flex his muscles in his view uh, you know, to Mr. Gordy. And Mr. Gordy was not having any of that. 
Why do you think, then given that, why do you think that they were able to kiss and make up relatively quickly? I think that Eddie Holland, frankly, I wasn't at the meetings. These were like kind of principal to principal meetings, but my understanding is that Eddie Holland kind of acknowledged that uh, what he had done was all kind of done out of spite and that he really regretted doing it. And I think a lot of that was self, uh, it was done because of self-interest because he was facing, right, a potential million dollar judgment against him personally as a result of the, the, the malicious prosecution case that we had pending at the time. But I think that that's what it was. And then once he did that, then Mr. Gordy was ready to move on to bigger and better things. It was, I think Mr. Gordy was reacting more to Eddie Holland's aggression towards him. And you know, his attitude was, you're not gonna, you know, you're not gonna intimidate and bully me. No one's going to do that. But then once Eddie Holland backed down and said, basically, my bad, I'm sorry, I wish we had never gotten into this, then Gordy was willing quickly to let it go and move on and um, you know, do some more productive things at from, that point in time with his life. From what I've read about uh, the history of Motown, they worked together very successfully after that, and there didn't seem to be any lingering bad blood related to the lawsuits. Exactly. They, they, like I said, they kind of kissed and made up at this point in time. There's probably, frankly, more bad blood between Eddie Holland, Brian Holland, and Lamont Dozier than there are between those three and Barry Gordy um, at this point, for whatever yeah, reason. I, I, mean, I don't know the insights of that, but that's that's kind of what I read. It's not, uh, you poked around and looked at the, the uh, there were a lot of lawsuits involving Motown. Um, Eddie Holland wasn't the only one to sue Barry Gordy back in the day. I know Barry Gordy was involved in a number of litigations. I know that the uh, the writers were involved in litigations against each other. It seems like it was somewhat of the wild, wild west there. Yeah, I think it was. You know, it was a brand new company that was founded kind of on the seat of their pants. They were moving quickly. Uh, they had extraordinary success very quickly in the process. And, you know, a lot of times I tell clients along with success comes more legal issues. And uh, I don't think Barry Gordy or Motown were any different in that respect than a lot of uh, clients that I've seen, you know, become very successful and all of a sudden people come out of the woodwork and want a piece of them, including by filing all types of lawsuits and, and, you know, trying to kind of get their pound of flesh or their piece of the pie. I think it's very interesting too, that you, you got a very thorough education in the law of unintended consequences, <laughs> because when you, you know, when you do certain things and you expect, certain <coughs> things, you don't factor in the, the loss of 126 boxes or the, the 13th box mysteriously getting sent to the wrong place. You have to be able to think on your feet and react to that. Yes, it was. I mean, it took. We were so stunned when we discovered that he had my memo that we didn't know what to do, and we were killing ourselves trying to figure out how that could have possibly happened. And of course, they wouldn't tell us, other than they would say, "Oh, you obviously deliberately produced these documents to us on several occasions." And you know, we had to kind of retrace our steps and figure out that that thirteenth box got mistakenly put into into the um, into the room. And what was really telling at the evidentiary hearing, and I think that this grabbed the judge's attention from the beginning, our very first witness was the associate from one of the firms that represented HDH. That was the, the associate that was literally in the room reviewing the documents, reviewing the, the 12, accidentally 13 boxes of documents. And he quickly and readily openly testified at the beginning yeah, I knew that there was an issue that this was probably a privileged document and I was concerned. And so I called the senior or the junior partner on the matter. That's the guy who's now the NFL football coach, or NFL football referee. And I talked to him about it. And when we called that guy to the stand, he said, well, yeah, I knew this was an issue. So I wasn't going to make a call on this. So I called the senior partner on the file. And then they talked about it. And they decided that they were going to do the following to make an argument that it was produced on multiple occasions. They told the associate, all right, take Hazard's memo and in handwriting, write it down verbatim on your pad, word for word, including the attachment. Then ask the paralegal who's sitting in there monitoring the uh, production 
to make a copy of that specific memo for you to take at that time. And then as you leave, order a copy of everything, right? Uh, so we want to have all the documents copied and delivered to our office. And they tried to use that as a, as a the basis for arguing that we had produced that memo to them on multiple occasions because they had written it down once, made a copy of it while there, and then ordered another copy. They said that constituted three voluntary productions by us of the, um, you know, of, of that memo. And the judge just was not buying it. I mean, they came across as pretty slimy when that testimony came out. And that was like in the first day or two of the evidence you're hearing on the disqualification motion. And we thought, you know, from that point on, we were in pretty good shape. Uh, we just had to kind of withstand their crazy arguments, including that my memo was subject to the crime fraud exception because it proved spoliation of evidence by the defendants. In in a case like that, do you does does anyone actually communicate the the malfeasance to the the uh, state bar? We didn't um, at that point in time, and again, you know, we were. We filed the disqualification motion that went up on appeal. And so while all of that was pending, we didn't know if it was appropriate to do anything vis-a-vis -vis the state bar. Uh, and then frankly, once we, it came back down and we were fighting over how much in attorney's fees we were going to get, um, we didn't think that trying to do something with the state bar was necessarily going to help advance Mr. Gordy's cause. It might, it might punish the lawyers, but as far as trying to bring this uh, long-standing dispute to a close, we thought the better course of action was to do something on the offensive vis-a-vis -vis Eddie Holland, not his lawyers, because he would throw his lawyers under the bus in a minute and just move on. And so that's why the malicious prosecution became such a key piece of, um, of our strategy in trying to put pressure on Eddie Holland to get him to drop and convince his brother and Lamont Dozier to drop their lawsuits in Detroit. Yeah, we, we thought the focus on the lawyers was great to deflect from their claims in Detroit, but further pressure on them, we didn't think was going to necessarily impact Eddie Holland as far as motivating Eddie Holland to, to, to settle these disputes. So it was strategic rather than more than idealistic. Yes, exactly. We were more, more focused on that. Does have, have we got any questions on the Q and A? I don't think so. Nope. Nope. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, this is a, a fascinating case. I know that actually Eddie Holland wrote a book and I believe Lamont Dozier also wrote a book. And I am looking forward to reading those to see how, what their perspective is on this, this entire litigation history. Yeah, it'd be pretty interesting to see. I know that from what I've read, Lamont Dozier was not very happy with Eddie Holland about his book. And so, uh, well, I think they were all, to, weren't they all also unhappy about the film Dream Girls? Because I know Mr. Gorey was unhappy about that um, in particular, um, but I wasn't involved in that that particular dispute, and I can't. Re I remember it was resolved. I don't. I don't recall how. I don't think that one gave birth to a lawsuit. No, I don't think so either. That would have been that would have been a tough case to win. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate the invitation and I hope people enjoyed this crazy story involving Barry Gordy, HDH, and Box 13. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.